So this video is going to cover the group relations continuum. When we talk about relationships between different ethnic groups, racial groups, or religious groups, there are several different types of relationships that those groups can have. So when we look at this chart, you can see that it's set up as a continuum. A continuum runs from one extreme to the other. So as you're looking at the group relations continuum, you can see on one side, we have the situation that would have the most prejudice and discrimination. And then all the way on the other end, we would have the situation with the least prejudice and discrimination. So what I want to do is go through these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different types of relationships that exist in the group relations continuum and tell you what each concept means and give you an example of that. So let's start out with genocide. Genocide is the type of group relations where you have the most prejudice and the most discrimination. And in genocide, the dominant group, whoever that might be, is trying to kill off or completely wipe out the minority group. Classic examples of that would be the Nazi Holocaust. There was a genocide in Armenia. We committed genocide against several Native American tribes. And so when you're trying to wipe them out, actively or passively, you are committing genocide. And that has the highest level of prejudice and discrimination. The next one would be expulsion. In expulsion, you are not trying to kill off the group, but you're trying to push them out or kick them out of your society. Think of the word expel, right? Expulsion means to expel. And so I remember examples of that, like with, in Kosovo, it happened with the Albanians in Kosovo um, in the 90s. Uh, the Cherokee Trail of Tears would be an example of that. Some of the attitudes that you've heard recently from certain uh, far-right groups that say we should try to expel undocumented immigrants, that would be an example of expulsion as well. The next type of group relations is going to be segregation. In segregation, you're not trying to kick the group out of your society, but you're trying to keep them confined to a small area in your society and not allowing them to have sort of a freedom to exist in all the different realms of your society, whether it's um, existing in separate schools or separate neighborhoods or separate religious institutions. The idea in segregation is that people are being separated. And there are two types of segregation. De jure segregation is by law, when the law requires that one group be at the back of the bus or in a different school or only confined to a certain neighborhood, that would be de jure segregation. De facto segregation occurs when you have no laws that encourage that behavior, but practices, informal practices that do. So maybe real estate agents are steering people away from a particular neighborhood saying, you know, you don't want to live here. There's too many of these people fill in the blank with whoever that might be. That would be de facto segregation or people saying, I really prefer to live with people like me. There's no law that requires that, but what we see is practices that encourage that kind of behavior. Assimilation occurs when the minority group is expected to blend into the dominant group. So in assimilation, the dominant group's norms are considered the standard for everyone to follow. And the minority group is expected to take on the characteristics of the dominant group. So for example, when people say immigrants who come to America need to learn to speak English, that would be an example of assimilation. The idea that the dominant group's language is what everybody should take on. When we see people saying, you know, for example, that African Americans should straighten their hair or not braid their hair, that's an assimilation mentality that you, know, you would fit better into America if you did something to whiten your appearance. Or, or maybe it's changing your name to sound more Anglo-Saxon. That would be an example of assimilation. So you're not, um, you know, Shu Yan Mei, you're 
Sally Mae or something like that. So what people do is they often try to blend into the dominant group to get more acceptance. At the same time, the dominant group still often has quite a bit of uh, prejudice against the minority group. In accommodation, the minority group is expected to take on some traits of the dominant group, but they're also allowed to keep some of their own traits. For, so for example, they may learn to speak English, but they still might eat their ethnic dishes at home. They may um, go to school with kids in the dominant group, but they still, um, maybe on Saturday, send their kids to German school so they can learn the German language, or maybe they go to Hebrew school to learn you know, Jewish traditions and the, the language that's spoken um, traditionally by many Jewish people. But during the week, they might be going to a public school and you know, blending in with all the other kids. So in accommodation, you're taking some of the dominant group's traits, but you're keeping many of your own group's traits as well. The situation with the least prejudice and discrimination would be pluralism or multiculturalism. In a pluralist or multicultural society, there is no dominant group. Every group has their fair say. If you're 20% of the population, you're 20% of the teachers and 20% of the CEOs and 20% of the prisoners, you're well represented across all aspects of society. And one group's values and beliefs are not considered the norm. They're not considered the standard. They're not considered superior. There are multiple sort of uh, norms and values that can be embraced. My students have asked me, can I think of an example of multiculturalism, you know, like a real life example of a society that's like that. And frankly, one of the challenges here is that they're really, it's an ideal type. There really aren't societies that exist that are truly multicultural. We do have some aspects of multiculturalism that we embrace. So for example, here in the US, we love everybody's food. You can give us Thai food, you can give us Japanese food, you can give us Chinese food, you can give us Mexican food, you can give us, who have I forgotten, Indian food. We'll take anybody's food. We might not want your people, which would be indicative of more segregation or expulsion, but we often embrace these food cultures from different groups, almost as like a badge of, you know, saying I'm, I am a really diverse person, I've eaten a lot of food. Um, but overall, we still don't have that. Like if you look at our political system, we don't have all groups represented equally. If you look at our education system, some groups are getting uh, better representation than other groups. And so we're not at the point of being a multicultural society. And, and the last question that I will leave you with, one for you to ponder and one for us to talk about as a group is, where are we in the US? What stage in this um, assimilation versus multiculturalism versus segregation versus genocide versus expulsion, where are we at as a country? And has that changed over time? And you might want to think about how that might be different in different social institutions, maybe different for different groups, or maybe different in different regions. And so that's the question you really want to think about. Where are we? Where are we headed? What would be an example? Of, you know, are we a society that leans towards multiculturalism, towards assimilation, towards accommodation, towards uh, expulsion or segregation? That is the key for you to be thinking about when you see you know, what's going on in our society today.